So um, my name is Dr. Claire T uh, Tupling. I spent 18 years in higher education as a lecturer. Um, so I've got, I consider myself to have um, quite a lot of lived experience of being a um, academic in higher education um, uh, 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 with, with a stammer. Uh, so let me just move this on. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm just going to introduce the presentation really in terms of this idea of inclusionism. So this is a, a concept that we're probably all familiar with, that higher education institutions um, subscribe to policies of in inclusion. But um, I'm just going to kind of problematize that before going on very briefly, I and mean, I know other people have talked about all assessments, um, but I really want to highlight how we can do better, and we can do better by going beyond reasonable adjustments. I think we can radically reinvent oral assessments. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the hidden voices, both in academia more general, but also hidden voices of research. And I'm still very much involved with educational research, even though I've moved out of higher education. And then I'm going to finish with um, some ideas, really. It's, they're not answers on how we can normalise this, this fluency. So um, just to begin with, then, um, if you work in higher education, if you're a student, you will know that inclusion is something that is talked about a lot in higher education. And um, this is not necessarily a positive thing. So um, so I, I'll rephrase that. On, on the one hand, it's it, it is really positive that we want to um, include, we, we want to make sure that as many people who um, are included they can access higher education um, both in terms of um, getting into higher education but in terms of being included in their journey in higher edu education um, but researchers like Bolt um, talk about inclusionism as, as a kind of a a policy that higher education pursues but yet within a framework of ableism so they pursue it because they have to pursue it people expect them to be inclusive but actually there's a lot more work to do if higher education is fully inclusive and within that we can look at um um this idea of there is a pervasiveness of normalcy in higher education so talking about disability and stammering in particular, that um, it's, it isn't seen as, uh, stammering isn't seen as normal. It is outside of expectations. The disfluent voice is still an ab aberration. It's not particularly welcomed. And if we think about also, um, we've talked a little bit already about presentations, uh, but also um, if we think about what I did for 18 years or so, which was lecturing and the perceptions that students and colleagues had of um, of of lecturing and presentations, they valued people that were able to talk fluently. And Carpenter warns us against this illusion of knowing driven by fluency. So this is the idea that if something is expressed in a fluent way, that it must be true, that it must carry more weight than thing than um, presentations or teaching that is uh, 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 presented um, in in a disfluent or st or stammering voice. And um, there is research that tells us that um, fluent speakers are more valued than speakers who may have uh, non-fluencies and 
disfluencies in in their speech but we also know that that changes over time um, as a result of greater exp exposure to those diverse ways of speaking so um students may f find may report that they believe somebody to be a better teacher because they sound uh, more fluent but that doesn't mean that higher education should therefore only employ lecturers that are fluent because we know that perception changes over time um let's go on to the next so i'm going to talk a little bit about oral assessments because this is something that i'm really quite uh passionate about so in my time in higher education I challenged many of the um, assessments that we did with students in terms of their oral assessments largely because um, colleagues would value a presentation if it was de delivered fluently so um, what can we do with all assessments? I don't agree that we should get rid of them altogether. I, I do think they are valuable for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I think there are limits to those reasonable adjustments. I think extra time, it might be useful, but I think it's an off the peg fix that might be appropriate in some cases, but some people might not need that extra time. That extra time might be a safety mechanism that allows a student to um, feel as though they're able to complete a presentation in that time. It takes the pressure from them. But even with extra time, I um, I think or I've witnessed what I've called fluentist assumptions inherent in assessment criteria so this is what i mentioned briefly before when um criteria the assessment criteria that universities use to assess all presentations sometimes include things like clarity of speech um absence of stammering um is delivered fluently and when these are included in the assessment criteria obviously tutors um, are going to make judgments according to that criteria. Um, I would argue, and I, I know that many in in the in the stammering community and beyond um, would argue that um, people who stammer can uh, uh, can uh, de deliver really good presentations. That fluency is not. Um, essential to deliver a good presentation um so there is that that there is that judgment maybe in assessors that don't realize that they might still value a fluent presentation uh, as being a good presentation but there's also other knowledge that tutors might lack about stammering so they might not realize when a student is um swapping words or when they're using a different word because they can't say the chosen word, and they might not realise that somebody is stammering. So there's a lot of awareness raising. Um, so what I prefer then is to go, what I'm proposing is to go beyond um, reasonable adjustments such as extra time. And I would argue for a manifesto um, for oral and signed assessment so i don't think we can exclude students who uh, use british sign language for ex example because they are also um disadvantaged by um the requirements around oral assessments so i think we can re redefine what a presentation is um, um i haven't got an answer to that but I think we can. I think we've got the power within us, as as people who st st stammer, to think creatively about what an oral assessment or what a presentation is and can and should be, and whether it just relies solely on an oral component or whether it includes other 
elements as well because communication is uh um is more than the spoken word and maybe there's ways we can incorporate other ideas into all assessments um so um if i'm if we turn to the hidden voices of academia or higher education um there is a um as as we've talked about before um already this evening there is a um that there are some people who stammer that don't wish to disclose that they stammer that are that are covert and um, so there is a reveal conceal dilemma that's been discussed uh, by other researchers uh, for example kirsch baum and ling son and stammering sits in between this hidden disability and one which might be willingly or unwillingly disclosed and Ling Som has talked about the silencing of the impaired self. And I think that fits in really well with this reveal conceal dilemma and in terms of the masking behaviours or the concealing behaviours that some people who stammer use to, to pass as fluent. So um, choosing to choosing to either not disclose or to reveal a stammer um, um if you choose to conceal your stammer that makes sense in an environment that demands or expects and values fluency and there is a risk to stammering openly as it involves um potentially it involves responses that reinforce the stigma of of stammering and Kirschbaum talks about um how there may be negative consequences to disclosing so somebody who stammers has to weigh up whether they um should dis disclose um and of course some people who stammer haven't got any choice but to disclose um Horton and Tucker discuss how um, the negotiation of reasonable adjustments might identify the person who stammers as potentially less effective. Now, I don't agree that somebody who stammers is less effective because they are asking for reasonable adjustments, but there may be a perception um, that if you are asking for less uh, for reasonable adjustments, that you you might be seen as less effective because fluent people can um can get along fine without reasonable adjustments um and so that's something again the the that um people who stammer have to decide whether um to disclose or um whether to um actually ask for um um a reasonable adjustments but at least disclosing does mean that you've then <clears throat> Got a, you've got a means of securing adjustments in order to demonstrate that you are just as effective as 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 your colleagues. Um, so <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about research, um, the hidden voices of uh, research, because I'm very much involved in educational research in 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 my current. Um, Role and um, I was also very much supporting um, emerging researchers in, in um, when I worked in higher ed education. Um, so I would say that fluent voices dominate research, and while other voices are marginalised and um, there is a chrono politics to academia. So chrono politics refers to the time, um, the kind of uh, time limitations that are put on certain activities in in higher education. Um, I've previously talked about the three minute thesis, 
I do have a YouTube video on on this where I take it apart. So the three minute thesis is exactly what it says it is. It's a competition that's run every year throughout higher education where PhD students uh, are invited to deliver a three minute presentation um, summarizing their th thesis. I've recently experienced something that's even that sounds even worse is a 90 second oral presentation to accompany a poster presentation. Now, the problem with things like the three minutes thesis and these examples of um, present your poster in 90 seconds is that there are no obvious um, adjustments to, to these requirements and approaching the organizing bodies reveals a lack of awareness of um, how this can be made um, more inclusive. And in terms of the research research itself, the able-bodied researcher is normative. Researchers are assumed to um, not have any disabilities. Sorry, I've skipped on a little bit too quickly there. Um, um, so in terms of speech, for example, if you're doing an interview, it is assumed that the, the interviewer um, has fluent speech. Um, there are um, people that challenge uh, these. So Kieran Burke, for example, has talked about who Kieran Burke is a researcher who's who's done as he talks about the prescriptive rules of qualitative research there was so there are certain rules that you're supposed to follow in order to achieve a successful interview and these can be seen as 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 problematic for uh, people who stammer and also in the research literature um um participants who have disabled speech are seen as challenging um so that it's um it's the participant that's seen as problematic because they can't access the interview rather than the other way around the interviewer has to find um different ways of of approaching um uh, uh participants that, that might have speech disabilities so in terms of these assumptions about interviews i could draw on my own experience i very nearly didn't get a job as a researcher um, many years ago because of my stammer, because one of the people on the panel perceived it might be a problem to ca uh, in terms of carrying out interviews. And I only got the job because somebody else on the panel uh, knew me as having had experience of carrying out research. So um, I'm just going to finish off then with these um, ideas around normalizing this fluency. So the first one is quite a general one. Um, it's up to us as members of the academy, as either students or, um, um, or as academics to challenge these fluentist assumptions. And that's word, that word fluentist is something that I made up. Um, now, that's easier said than done, I guess. I mean, there's different ways we can challenge fluentist assumptions. Another way might be stammering openly, but I've talked about all, uh, all why that might be a challenge for some people who stammer. But I do believe that stammering openly is a ra radical act. Um, researching stammering. So this is something that I'm doing myself um um i'm drawing on my own ex exp experience of being in higher education and i'm looking at the moment at uh lecture capture and the automated captions that are produced and how they translate stammering i can talk about that on another occasion um and and finally um, professional network groups. So there's several of these um, under the auspices of Stammer. And a few of us have talked about uh, setting up a professional network group for higher education uh, staff who Stammer. And so 
there you go. I will now stop sharing so that I can actually see you all and see the chat.